three remarks why we should think that it's important to have this debate in this larger um, auditorium. One is that, of course, these kind of conferences, and especially in the degrowth debate, always is in the tension between what are our concrete experiences, what is going on in our concrete struggles, and then to link it to transition, transnational experiences and, um, and, and struggles. And I think this is worse that we have these north-south uh, debates to um, improve, to, to um, deepen our transnational perspectives against the background of experiences. Yeah. Additionally, I have the impression that given the multiple crises in Europe, the severe and, and, and multidimensional crisis, that not even the official Europe tends to be Eurocentric um, 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 oriented towards inner Europe, important enough, but forgetting a bit what's happening in the world, but also the debates on alternatives. And um, this is the second question why we think that it's important to have this debate tonight. And the third is that being in Europe and struggling here, trying to, to um, construct alternatives is taking place in a context, you know this qu famous quote, it's obviously more easy to imagine today the end of the world, ecologically, whatever, than to imagine the end of capitalism. So we, I'm very keen to listen to experiences from other uh, parts of the world, whether this is true or whether the the, the crisis, the ecological crisis and other dimensions of the crisis are much more intrinsically linked to the quest of, to the, to the um, um, interrogation of capitalism. So it's helpful to listen to other voices, to other experiences from other regions. And, and this is why I'm, when I present you the four panelists. I invited them to talk at the beginning 12 to maximum 15 minutes. We will have a short conversation here um, at the podium, and then, of course, we will open up, not only for questions. If you have comments, additional remarks, of course, you are invited. Miriam Lang, who is going to start, is Assistant Professor for Social and Global Studies at the Andean University in Quito, Ecuador, and she is member and, in fact, also founder of the permanent working group um, Beyond Development, which is a working group um, organized by Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Quito, um, existing since 2011. Edgardo Lander, at uh, the site, um, uh, Miriam sits at the very left of your, um, from your perspective. Edgardo Lander, beside Miriam, is also a member of this group Beyond Development and is professor of sociology at the Central University of Venezuela. He will speak second and he is also a member of the Transnational Institute many of you uh, might know. Ashkish Kotari, he's, uh, I would say, really global activist, intellectual. Um, I met him, we, we um, recognized this morning um, the, for the first time 20 years ago at a conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity where I um, interviewed him for my PhD <laughs> dissertation. And now um, we met so many times at um, different places of the world. Ashish is from India and he works or founded the NGO uh, Kalvab um, Prish and he's also working um, on the um, and many, many, many alternatives. And beside Ashish is Beatriz Rodriguez Lavallos. She works at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, was member and uh, also coordinator of EJOLT, an important um, um, research project, also very activist and she's also member of Research and Degrowth the international structure which brings us here together. My name is Uli Brandt, I work at the University of Vienna and I'm also member of the working group Beyond Development in Latin America. And all we five are members of a recently um, founded working group um, which is also called Beyond Development. It's trying to bring together international global debates um, which is coordinated by the Brussels office of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. So, I wish us um, an insightful evening, also hopefully some um, 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 yeah, interesting uh, questions, debates, also that we can um, elaborate a bit better our understanding and I give Miriam the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks, Uli. Thanks to the organizers. I'm really happy to be here and to be in this panel. And I'm happy that we have this panel. And I hope we will continue the discussion afterwards in all spaces. <laughs> um, 
I would like to talk to you about the core issue of the left, both in the North and the Global South, which is welfare policies, or welfare in general. Uh, a bit picking up the fundamental task for the left that Daniela mentioned the first night here. She said the task is to produce some egalitarian politics that are not productivist and extractivist. That means based on other societal nature relations. And I would like to add that they also should be not colonial. That means not considering welfare as a privilege for some countries based on resource transfer from other countries and not patriarchal. And I mean this. Um, I think when we think about North-South relationships, that degrowth and the whole debate or current on alternatives to development, which are informed by the Buen Vivir perspective, are complementary. So there is not really a need to convince each other of our concepts. But there is a need to always see each other. And this doesn't always happen when we develop strategies, for example, or we do, when we do analysis. This would change our analytic focus if we saw more the north in the south and vice versa. Um, and I think I'm convinced that there is a deep interdependency regarding profound social transformation between the north and the south. We won't be able to do one without the other. So we can't say transformation is going to come from somewhere else and we just are going to be solidarian with this struggle. That doesn't work. We have to transform. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to make a step in this direction by bringing you some lessons learned from the experience of progressive Latin America, uh, concretely from the Ecuadorian experience where I live. Um, where we have had, as you certainly know, historically rather good conditions for social change in the last years. Um, there was a regional hegemony of progressive governments or left forces in many countries of South, South America for some years. And in Ecuador, for example, Buen Vivir has been uh, introduced in the Constitution in 2008 as a guiding principle. But this process is now coming to an end because of the collapse of commodity prices. And so the big success story that remains about progressive government in Ecuador is without doubt the reduction of poverty and inequality. In fact, poverty has been reduced in by official numbers by 14% and extreme poverty by 8% between 2007 and 2015. And there has been this big increase in social spending which contrasts very much with austerity politics, for example, in Europe. Um, but the debate has been mostly framed as neo-Keynesianism versus neoliberalism and that has had consequences. Um, there was effectively a strong demand for the return of the state, uh, stated by the social movements that struggled against neoliberalism in the 90s and that may, built the conditions for progressive government to come. Uh, and that was successful. Now we have state absolutely everywhere in Ecuador to an extent that it uh, considers itself at the only, as the only legitimate actor of change um, and sees any kind of autonomous process as a political threat. So the result has been the dismantling of the big social organizations like the indigenous movement, the workers' movement, the student movement, feminist movement survives somewhere on the border. Um, the criminalization of protests and a very sterile polarization of political debate like black and white, you're with me, you're against me, and nothing in between. Um, so after these 10 years of progressive rule, we can look back and see that the historical opportunity 
has not been taken in a very good way. Today, uh, foreign debt and privatizations are back in spite of the statement of the government that neoliberalism has been overcome and poverty is also on the rise again. And there is especially this dark side of all the social spending, which is the deepening of extractivism. Even this emblematic internationally so well-known initiative to leave the oil in the soil in the Yasuni National Park in the part of the Amazon forest in Ecuador has been taken back in 2000. Uh, 13, because we need the money for poverty reduction. So what has happened is a sort of taking hostage social justice and playing it out against environmental justice. And the official discourse states very strongly, if you ask for both of them, you are naive, you are infantile and unrealistic. So this brought me and a couple of other people to ask what kind of social justice is this then that we can only have if destroying nature and what else have we lost on this path and maybe we should have a closer look what does this mean for a social transformation that we seek to address in all dimensions of domination um, and of course yeah, the official objective of the government was to implement a one-to-one -one copy of the European welfare state of the 60s. This is like someone said the other day, not the welfare state of today, the one of the 60s. <laughs> yeah, um, imitating classical developmentalism also in the means, not only in the objectives. This means that modes of living that today still are not totally permeated by modern capitalist relations like indigenous or rural modes of living but also urban practices of interaction and yeah neighborhood organization have been very strongly devaluated as poor as miserable as backwards by the presidential discourse um, and I would like to share three examples of welfare policies and their consequences. The first one is the expansion of this classical neoliberal instrument to tackle extreme poverty, which is conditional cash transfer to those families that are identified as the poorest in cash, which has been expanded to much more people by the progressive government, which obviously made life easier for many of the urban poor, but in the countryside and regarding those alternative modes of living has also introduced money circulation, lots of private debt, and has displaced cultural systems. And now it is being reverted because the government has no money anymore to distribute, and this brings about harsh social problems. Um, because there was the offer to include the indigenous to the Western modern mode of living, but that doesn't work because the whole society is so discriminating that they never will be really included. So they get into a non-place. The second example is about health what I call a perverse logic of compensation. It says, yes, we are going to poison your environment and you probably will fall ill, but don't worry because we're gonna build a very modern hospital in your neighborhood and we're gonna attend you with the best phys physicians that we can find. So people are in this disjunctive of getting ill but having health care or not having health care and maybe not getting ill. Um, and what gets lost there is traditional community-based approaches to health and also community networks that had been created and have been finished by the official health policies because of quality standards. And the third example is about education. Ecuador's Rafael Correa government has proclaimed the new economy as a knowledge-based economy. Uh, so there was obviously a big educational reform that 
has put pri priority on infrastructure, on computers in schools, on laboratories, on technical stuff, and on centralizing and controlling the educational system, which was pretty chaotic before, it's true. But before, we had 20 years of experience with an intercultural bilingual uh, indigenous managed system of education in small villages, which was co-managed by the state and by the organizations, and there was lots of debates and lots of experimentation. And although not everything went well, of course, uh, the government decided to shut all of this down and end it, instead of giving it better conditions and engaging in some dialogue. So what has been lost here would be a sense of knowledge that really makes sense for concrete children in concrete contexts, the possibility to learn critical thinking and also all the intercultural dialogue. So in conclusion, I think that what we can learn from this process is that despite all the discussions about alternative forms to measure well-being, and in Ecuador there are lots of discussions about measuring buen vivir in the state, in the real world the assessment of so-called human needs is still taking place in a rather colonizing, symbolically violent and absolutely non-democratic way. And it is still assumed that someone knows what people need and that it's the same for everybody. So um, that's why I would like to point out that also the paths to welfare are multiple, always have to be multiple, and this is why in our working group at some point we started to talk about los buenos vivires in plural and not only one as a vision. Um, we also could learn, learn that welfare can be functional to capitalist accumulation and coloniality, even if it's not commodified and privatized. And that this depends on the logic it follows, uh, because if this logic is one of social inclusion as inclusion into the modern mode of living, the capitalist matrix, or even worse, financial inclusion, then this happens, or if democracy is conceptualized as democratization of consumption, as it has happened in South America very, very much, and redistribution only as redistribution of income. So I think we have lots of tasks for the future. We have to begin making a difference between types of poverty, like the poverty that is like this, which corresponds to non-capitalist practices or modes of living and is no real poverty because people live according to their needs. And the other poverty that is constantly produced by capitalism and by development and growth through the inequalizing process. And we have also to engage in a critical reflection on European welfare state as the desirable universal model. And maybe, and that's difficult, I think. It's very much inside our minds. <laughs> um, and acknowledge that this, un this real existing welfare state only was possible because of the Cold War and the system con concurrence, because of the colonial history. And yet last night we had dinner and came to the point that it obviously also relies on growth because it's financed by taxes. <laughs> so this would lead us to decouple our understandings of redistribution not only from the modern and capitalist mindset, but also, I think, from the Marxist and socialist mindset, which also understands reproduction as repro re uh, redistribution as redistribution of income in the first place, or as means of production, but we have to open new dimensions to the idea of reproduction, uh, redistribution, like the access to the commons, material ones, immaterial ones, the rep redistribution of work and time and of care. And this is why you notice now, I think, degrowth and alternatives to development are complementary. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Miriam. So we already heard the uh, concept uh, famously debated in Latin America on resource extractivism, neo-extractivism. And Edgardo comes from Venezuela, which is the, currently the sad role model of the disaster of uh, neo-extractivism. So could you give us um, briefly an outline, um, an understanding, a better understanding what is happening what, uh, currently in Venezuela, but at the same time there is an emerging new concept which is called post-extractivism. And in what sense this concept of post-extractivism is related to the um, ambiguous and uh, currently very crisis-driven experiences of neo-extractivism. Please. Thanks, Uli. <coughs> I want to thank the organizers of this conference for the possibility of <coughs> participating. Um, in spite of foolish questions, I'm going to talk basically about the growth debates and extractivism in Latin America and with references to Venezuela at the end. The most important debates in Latin America today that are related to issues <coughs> of degrowth are framed in the terms of extractivism and post-extractivism. There are many reasons why it could have been expected that Latin America as a region was the place in the world where struggles against capitalism, against imperialism, for the transformation towards a non-capitalist society uh, could be intertwined, coupled directly with struggles for a transformation of a civilization. A radical questioning of this growth-led assault on so-called nature and this patriarchal, <clears throat> anthropocentric vision of the world. In the struggles against neoliberal governments, against the military dictatorships, against the Free Trade Treaty of the Americas, there was an enormous convergence of movements from all over the continent in which indigenous movements and peasant organizations and Afro-descendants had a very important political and ideological role in contributing to a sort of shared grammar of in the definition of what's at stake and what are the alternatives. When the progressive governments were elected, starting with Chavez in 1998, this was a result of the previous processes of social struggles. However, the progressive governments not only continued along this colonial extractive path, but in every single case, deepened the extractive path. This has increased the supply of, com of the commodities required to feed the global predatory logic of, of old and emerging powers, and has contributed to the strengthening of the capitalist order that the governments are confronting in their discourse. Precisely at the moment when in the continent, in the <clears throat> South America, the rights of indigenous people have been constitutionally recognized. When some, in some of the same constitutions, the states are defined as plurinational and pluricultural, when there's a questioning of the authoritarian character of a monocultural liberal state in heterogeneous societies and the continuation of this colonial authoritarian imposition for 500 years, when the rights of nature are recognized either constitutionally or in legal terms, the predatory extractive logic of this possession is being accelerated occupying and dev devastating even those territories that over the last five centuries have remained to some extent or completely beyond the limits of capital expansion. In these territories, in these new frontiers of global capital, water, soil are being polluted, forests destroyed, biodiversity reduced, populations displaced, indigenous cultures 
destroyed. Crops for self-consumption and local markets have been replaced by export-oriented GMO monocultures like soy, threatening food sovereignty. Despite clear constitutional mandates, this government have not and could not have recognized the rights of the indigenous people and Afro-descendants to the traditional territories because these are precisely the territories that they have to, that they have to decided that have to be subjected to this global extractive logic. In terms of the devastating impact of these activities on the environment and on indigenous people, Afro-descendants and peasants, it is indifferent whether these participating corporations are domestic or foreign, Western or Oriental, Eastern, public or private, or that the discord that seeks to legitimize these depredatory activities are based on the market or the revolution. Extractivism is not, as has been argued by Alvaro Garcia Lineras, the vice president and chief ideologue of the Bolivian process, a technical form that's compatible with any model of society. On the contrary, in its current grand scale, it reproduces the role played by Latin America in the historical division of labor and nature that has characterized the capitalist colonial world system for more than five centuries. It constitutes a deepening of the anthropocentric, patriarchal, and colonial civilizing pattern that leads to the destruction of life. It is just not a mode of, product, of organizing the economy, but a type of society. In addition to producing goods, the extractive model contributes to the formation of social agents, of the social agents involved in the process. It creates subjectivities and tends to mold state-centered, rent-seeking, and patronage-based, often corrupt political systems, which tend to have some more overt or less overt authoritarian tendencies. It generates an increasing reliance on the, of the popular sectors on the state in terms of transfers and the sort of issues that Miriam was talking about in terms of social policies. It generates an increasing weakening of the autonomous ca capabilities of these organizations and thus contributes to weakening the possibilities of de democracy. As demonstrated conclusively by the Venezuelan experience of 100 years of oil, once extractivist and rentier logic has been installed as a basic organizing principle of a society, it is extremely difficult to reverse. Extractivism in Latin America has been inseparably interwoven with the state-centric consumption, conception and political practices, as was the case in 20th century socialism. This state-centric logic has enormous consequences. To the extent that the states have st strengthened and popular organizations and their leaders are absorbed into the state bureaucracy, the social energies of social movements and autonomous organizations have been weakened. These societies today, after 10, 15 years of progressive leftist governments, are less politicized and less mobilized than they were at the beginning of the cycle. Modernizing technocratic or improvised decisions from above, from centralized hyper-presidentialist states have hindered or impeded the plural process of social experimentation without which it is not possible to transform society. Overcoming capitalism and the path towards societies of a good life, able to live in harmony with nature, necessarily require processes of autonomy and disengagement from the processes of 
commodification that characterize capital. The creation of other social networks and productive spaces supported by alternatives to ethnic growth. Other cultural imaginaries and other patterns of consumption are required. In South America, this could only be possible within spaces of increasing regional integration density, supported by these other social logics. But this is not compatible with productive models that are based on extensive primary export, commodity export economies that are basically geared towards export to external regions. The notion of well-being, of the good life, when, it's, when it is not distorted by its capture by the state and its use to legitimize developmental uh, projects, it's not an attempt to achieve a more humane capitalism or a more sustainable mode of development. It implies, on the contrary, a radical critique of the universal linearity of historical development and of the very idea of development. Given the unstoppable advance of this predatory logic, the struggles and resistances against extractivism and the infrastructure required for extractive activities, dams, roads, pipelines, ports, have not only continued but have increased in countries led by both progressive and new, and new liberal governments. Continental networks have been articulated against large-scale mining, oil exploitation, large hydroelectric dams, monoculture of <clears throat> GMOs. Indigenous people, Afro-descendants, and residents of small towns far away from the main urban metropolis are the major agents, subjects of the struggles. However, in the context of a growth culture that continues to be dominant, a culture that has actually been reinforced by the policies and discourse of progressive governments, these struggles, in spite of the fact that they are widespread, confront many obstacles. While faith, faith in the virtues of development remain hegemonic, both in the right and the left, while governments continue to base their legitimacy on social policies financed by extractive activities, and while predatory impacts of extractive activities continue to be far removed from the metropolitan centers that concentrate most of the voting population, it will be difficult for this resistance to be assumed more broadly, especially in urban popular sectors that have been, have been to some extent favored by the social policies that have been financed by extractive activities. The illusion of the that the limits of the planet can be ignored, the illusion that it would be possible to replicate, as Miriam said before, in the South today, the model of the old Western European welfare state, in absence of the very specific historic economic and geopolitical conditions that made this experience possible, led these governments to seek their legitimacy in their capacity to provide an ever-increasing level of consumption. In the words of Buaventura de Sosa Santos, referring to the Brazilian case, he says that the petty governments have been more successful in creating consumers than in contributing to the emergence of citizens. Redistribution via social inclusion policies, state subsidies, and direct cash transfers respond to legitimate demands of the population, no, but they do not contribute to alter the productive structures of society and the deep inequalities that characterize this continent. They also feed on the expectations that the state will be indefinitely in capacity to operate as an overall provider. On the other hand, given the political legitimacy and the need for re-election faced by these governments depend to such an extent on the government's spending capacity, it seems that the expansion of extractivism is the only short-term way to 
have access to the required resources. In this sense, extractivism is not only a political option, it's a structural issue. It has to do with the relations between North and South. Unless there's a radical reduction of demand of commodities from the North, unless the imperial mode of living, as <clears throat> that Uli has worked on, is tackled seriously, it's extremely difficult to expect a transformation of this <clears throat> pathological pattern of destruction. Today we're a historical end of a, of a cycle, not only of the cycle of high demand and prices for commodities, but the cycle of progressive governments. The governments of Argentina and Brazil have been replaced by far-right neoliberal governments. The Bolivian and Ecuadorian governments are facing severe difficulties. And the most dramatic case, Venezuela is facing the reality of what can be called the collapse of the petro frontier state. And a new attempt by the government to replace the century-old base frontier extractive logic with an even more depredatory logic. The opening of 12% of the total territory, a territory twice the size of Croatia, to open pit mining by transnational corporations. This is the so-called mining arc of the Orinoco, which covers territories of indigenous people, covers massive ex extensions of forests and savannas that have enormous biological diversity, it is the source, the main source of water in the country, as well as the main source of electricity. This so-called revolutionary government is implementing in this project, which I insist it's 12% of the total territory, the most open pro-transnational neoliberal policies that one could imagine. Thank you. Ashish, what are some key lessons we can learn from um, the search um, for alternatives in South Asia? And since you have been also two years ago in Leipzig, if you have a, a first impression of this conference and where did we get further? Where is a kind of a consolidation of the degrowth debate? And the third question you might tackle is, in India, there's the strong emergence of nationalist forces in a, let's say, semi-peripheral country, and this is also a major problem in Europe. What are alternatives, emancipatory alternatives, to, um, to, to question and to overcome these nationalist tendencies? Please. Thanks, uh, Uli. That's quite a combination of questions. Uh, in 10 minutes, but I mean, I do have the advantage, uh, which uh, unlike my colleagues of, uh, of having one and a half hours tomorrow morning, so I will start boring you folks uh, over the next 10 minutes, but please be prepared to be bored tomorrow morning also with further elaboration of what I'm going to say. Um, I think if you look at India today, one of the things that stands out is how it, along with China, is becoming the new colonizer of the globe, or wanting to be. Um, this is something that Gandhi said uh, several decades back, that if India were to take the development path of, uh, of England, it would wipe out the earth like a swarm of locusts. Now, of course, China is ahead of us. Uh, India hasn't yet got there, but it's following very much. And this is a colonization that's, uh, that's dual. It's an internal colonization, which means it's the takeover of lands and resources and knowledge and forests and so on of, of its own people, of those who are already marginalized and who don't have the power uh, of decision making. And it's a colonization of lands uh, and peoples outside. For instance, uh, half a million hectares in Ethiopia is taken over by uh, Indian corporations uh, with the help of the government, both governments. Um, so this is, uh, this is a new, relatively new phenomenon that needs to be looked at. It's an, it's, it's an incredible 
erasion of our own memory that we were colonized for 200 years and suffered the consequences. We kind of we've forgotten that. It's in the history textbooks, but just about marginally so. And now we ourselves are becoming uh, a colonizer. Um, the results of both this internal and external colonization, well, I should also say that there is a, there is what, what, what we're seeing in India right now is a lethal combination of four or five factors. One, even now a centralist state in many different ways. The bureaucracies that ordinary citizens have to confront are still extremely daunting. Second, a predatory market, and that has increased especially in the last 25 years of so-called globalization and, and privatization. Third, and that's the point you're making, Uli, um, an increasingly powerful orthodox religious elite, especially, especially a Hindutva elite, uh, but increasingly as a result of that also other religions. And all of this in combination with things, uh, inequalities and exploitation continuing from the past, whether it's patriarchy or it's caste, which is peculiarly Indian and needs further explanation if there's time we can give that. So you see this really lethal combination uh, right now, which, uh, which is playing out in India and as a result of India's colonizing tendencies also elsewhere. The results are, of course, ecological unsustainability. Uh, in the, it's very visible anywhere you go in the country. You will see, uh, you will see ecological unsustainability of all kinds. Uh, it's increasing dispossession and displacement. I mean, for instance, a recent estimate put physical displacement, forcible displacement of people from their houses to elsewhere to about 60 million people. That's more than the population of most countries in the world. Uh, and that doesn't count people who are being dispossessed, even though they continue to live where they are living, but they be, they're dispossessed of their lands, the forest, the water, or other uh, survival resources, which must be tens of millions of more. It's also, you can see the results in things like 300,000 uh, farmers having committed suicide in the last couple of decades. Uh, just the sheer crisis of livelihoods in India's uh, countryside and also in its cities. And then also results in terms of social tensions and conflicts, inter-religious, inter-ethnic, uh, minority, majority kinds of conflicts which, uh, which have signif significantly increased. Um, and also the results in terms of crackdown on civil society. Um, there's growing intolerance of the state to dissent. We've had organizations of many kinds, including some that I'm involved with, uh, being uh, the government attempting to actually shut us down in many different ways. That's all the bad news. Um, I don't like dwelling too much on the bad news. In any case, we get that all the time in newspapers and on the internet and so on and so forth. But of course, it's, it has to be stated and confronted. The good news, the silver lining to all of this is that there are counter trends. There's, there are, there are uh, forces of two kinds, I would say, broadly, which are counter trends to these, these broad uh, trends. One is resistance. At any go given moment in time in India, you will find hundreds of places where people are resisting. They're resisting land disposition or the destruction of their forests and water uh, or uh, encroachment of cities into their lands or industries coming in or, or the piracy and theft of knowledge, etc. There's, there's resistance of various different kinds that you will find in different parts of India. And that resistance, to my mind, is... Uh, the most important part of, the at, of that resistance is what uh, we in India call the non-party political process. So it's politics. It is hardcore politics, but it's not politics of the elections and the political party kind of thing. But it's trying then also to influence, of course, what political parties say and do and how they behave, either outside of power or when, th when they are in power. But I think this non-party political process is something that I, I mean, tomorrow again I'll come back to it, is something really, really crucial. Because unfortunately, we've tended to focus a lot on how do we change the government, how do we get the right party in power, etc., rather than actually say, and this is part of the second trend that I'm talking about of, res of uh, uh, counter trends, which is people increasingly saying we will be the power. We want to actually take the power in our own hands to be able to decide what should happen in our lives and not simply be asking the government to do this and to, and to do that. That of course we do, but it's really about taking power in our own hands. So it's really movements of all kinds arguing for a radical democracy, radical ecological and economic democracy, reclaiming uh, the power over economics, reclaiming the power over our own bodies, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
there are enormous challenges though to all of this. One is of course that uh, the, the uh, five or six different forces that I spoke about of destruction and unsustainability and so on, of course are hitting back and they're not going to take any of this lying down. When you have resistance uh, movements or you have reconstruction and alternative movements, these, these forces are hitting back. And they do it either through direct undermining, through you know, just killing you off or, or imprisoning you or trying to shut you down or whatever or they do it more subtly through co-option. Uh, so in India now, because there's so much money flying around, uh, both the government itself and also foreign uh, uh, money that's available and corporate money that's available, you increasingly actually see the co-option of civil society taking place. Uh, the Coca-Cola Foundation, for instance, funds a sustainable water program in a particular university that I won't name right now, uh, and so on and so forth. So you actually see this kind of ways of undermining resistance uh, and, and alternatives. There's also a fragmentation of initiatives, and this is something we have to confront. It's a fragmentation not just in terms of there being scattered initiatives that are not connected up to each other, that's one problem, uh, but more so in terms of uh, distrust and or lack of the, the ability of building bridges for instance, between the environmental movement and the uh, trade unions or the industrial workers, especially the informal industrial workers uh, movements, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, there's a lot of tradi uh, historic distrust amongst them which we have to try and break through. Because of all of this, to my mind, alliances become really important. The forces that are confronting us are not just Indian, they are global, um, of all the kinds that I mentioned, and therefore, the need for alliances of all the alternative and the resistance movements across the world. And where, you, where we see that has happened, we find successes. Whether we take a case like the, the, the fight against the Vedanta Corporation that a local indigenous group fought, it's an iconic uh, struggle, so-called the Indian uh, Avatar, though I would say that the Avatar movie is the American uh, uh, anti-Vedanta struggle. Um, uh, so, where you see there is actually the indigenous people as the, at the core of the struggle, but also with civil society networks extending all the way to the UK, where because it's a UK based company, they were able to confront the cooperation there also. So I think it's this kind of alliances that we need to do much more of, uh, both in the resistance and in the creation of alternatives. But these are alliances that need to be based on, on a respect for diversity. So it's not about the whole world turning to degrowth or Buen Vivir or Swaraj or whatever, that we all come under one umbrella, but that we all have our own peculiar, unique and uh, uh, interesting ways of actually of creating resistance and alternatives. Uh, and the search then for what is common ground without labeling ourselves as any one of them. And that common ground to me is the fundamentals of ethics it's the values, it's the principles that we espouse in these movements, the principles of sharing and solidarity and so on. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit more of that uh, tomorrow. So, maybe at the moment I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. In terms of reflections on this conference, can I come back to it? Because it, I haven't really thought of that, but maybe at the end, if there's a couple of minutes, I can come back to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So while uh, Beatrice is um, preparing her uh, talk, she wants to talk and I ask you to focus more on the experiences of agents of change against the background of environmental justice movements and degrowth. I ask um, to think already, Edgardo, um, uh, Miriam, Ashish, Ashish already started with this idea of values and um, diversity. Just after her presentation and then afterwards we open it for a common reflection. Um, what, there are challenges for, of North-South alliances. So what, against your background, of your experiences, what are key challenges of North-South alliances and where are potentials? Ashish, you might make a second point and uh, Miriam and Edgardo, just one point and then we open the discussion. Please, Bea. So, um, well, uh, thank you for, uh, for inviting me to this, uh, to this panel. Um, as I lack the eloquence of my previous, <laughs> the previous speakers, I'll use some slides. Um, 
My interest in some years ago has been connecting uh, degrowth, which is the area that uh, we work in uh, research and degrowth, and then environmental justice, that is an area that we have been uh, working in the, in the frame of the usual project, not the initiatives. Um, and uh, my contribution today is uh, try, trying to and, and, and bring some ideas, some pieces of evidence that we have collected in the course of the last years on how they can um, meet. Uh, and for this, I will report on some things that uh, I've, uh, I, I reported in the past, so maybe you saw this somewhere, uh, but also some new, uh, da new data on the landscape of proposals from, environment, from environmental justice struggles and some ideas that supplement the previous ones on where to start. So, uh, some years ago, a couple of years ago, I asked to, to some critical thinkers, uh, some uh, environmental activists that uh, uh, are located in what we say, what we call the global south, what they thought about uh, degrowth. And to my surprise, because I expected uh, a very positive uh, perspective on this, uh, they said that the, uh, the alliance between environmental justice and degrowth was not so natural as, as we expected in, in, uh, in Barcelona, at least. And this was for a, a number of reasons. Many of them have been commented from the beginning of the, of the, of the conference. I will not elaborate on that, but uh, degrowing is not an, a, a, an attractive idea in, in some um, uh, areas of, in the south. Uh, then, uh, beyond the term itself, there are some disconnected ideas, as like working time, what does more working time mean in an indigenous context, for instance? Uh, and then there is the, yeah, all this discussion on, on how to communicate the idea of degrowth with this term. Um, then uh, the complaint on organ and Euro thinking, uh, Eurocentric thinking uh, as a new intellectual fashion that we, we have to adopt, adopt. But what it really surprised me was they said, uh, degrowth is not radical enough. And that was one, what? Yes, because uh, it, it seemed that the type of alternatives that were um, presented in the name of degrowth were kind of accommodating stances without no challenging. Is, is it uh, um, degrowth openly um, anti-capitalist? And since this debate has, de has developed, and I said now we can say yes, there is this, some discussions on this. But uh, some, a couple of years ago when I did make this question was not so clear. But there are many elements for hope. And this is because uh, instead of talking about commonalities on common grounds, they said why don't we talk about analogies, discussions that you have in the, co in the context of degrowth, and then discussions that we have in the context of environmental justice um, discussions in general, or the specific uh, activities we are involved. And here there are and some examples, and m many were mentioned, but uh, for instance, using the, the example of social comparison, no? this idea, of positional goods that we have, uh, we have discussed uh, sometimes. Well, why don't we do the analogy, in the case of Africa, this artificial division that was made at some point, that somehow creates hierarchies between countries in the same ter territory that share a lot of values and not a lot of cultural and even spiritual values. Why don't we use this analogy? And many others, of course. Um, well. But despite these uh, apparent uh, difficulties to uh, uh, advance towards an, uh, um, uh, an alliance, uh, as she's already mentioned, it is important to, to generate an alliance. And um, using a, a, a sentence that I am stealing from a young uh, woman in the other side, what they, in the, in the femini feminist anti-growth, uh, discussion, she says something like, what you academics have to, uh, have to learn from us that are in the street. I think the, the woman is in the room. So, um, uh, yes, what we, let's say, degrowists, uh, have to learn from environmental justice movements and strikes. And I bring here some, some, uh, some uh, the result of an, an analysis that is conducted together with colleagues from the Boasici University in Turkey. 
Uh, and this is uh, what you see here is the connection of uh, 346 mining conflicts involving more than 1,000 uh, civil society organizations and around 600 companies. Then when you connect the, the, the dots, when you connect those conflicts that are uh, in which two different organizations or a company connects, then you have the map of environmental justice struggles in regards to mining conflicts. This is kind of the global uh, environmental justice movement struggle uh, map. Okay. Then we, uh, thanks to this initiative of mapping uh, environmental justice conflicts you uh, probably have uh, heard about, uh, uh, we ask, what do you think about your uh, situation? You think your, your case is a case of environmental justice success? Then, in this way, we can um, achieve an idea of the level of success they identify with their own struggle. And then, when we, you, you do some maths, no? this is what we do in the, in the academia, we notice that in the cases where there are a higher number of CSOs, or in the cases where uh, a CSO is connected to a same, better connected CSO, uh, the outcome tends to be more positive in regards of how they define a success. And then, if this was really a very good result for us, when um, there are network, network effects, if my struggle is connected with her struggle and her struggle is connected with his, I share no, the results up to two levels. So this means there are network effects. If we create an alliance, these have positive effects. Of course, it might have negative effects as well. But then we can play with the other uh, elements. Let's, let's uh, work together. Let's connect with those that know the, better, the, the best what we are doing. Okay. So this is the idea of the need for an alliance. But then we need to be aware that not, possible, not all alliances are possible because in the environmental justice struggles there are many motivations that are not the same that we share in the degrowth uh, movements. So we ask, what is the alternative in your case? What is, you don't want the, the mining project, what do you want? Well, the first answer was, we don't want the mining project. And understanding that the no is an alternative is very important because we are always asking once and again to the movements, what do you propose instead? Well, I propose instead living as I was living before you arrived. So this is, um, this is one thing that we have, I think, to develop further in terms of... <coughs> the discussion, the joint discussion. Then, of course, when the damages are involved... Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. When, that, which, when damages are involved, it is normal to notice or to, to realize that people want some type of remedial, dam, uh, the remedial measures. They want to improve or to remediate some impacts, etc. Then, uh, then it's also the claim for the recogni recognitions of previously not rec unrecognized uh, uh, rights. So we notice in this uh, in regards uh, that the conflicts are uh, revulsive, no? a driver of... Uh, also institutional and, uh, let's say, rights systems. Then what we, as analysts, but with a higher respect, call uh, local developmentalism. is the typical situation when, well, we want this ecotourism project, or we want this agroecology initiative, which are very important efforts in context where the uh, actors in the case are under strong pressures, but still they don't seem to challenge the whole uh, set of pressures they have on the top of them. And then we, we see let's say, in a, in a, with, with hope, in terms of the alliance with uh, degrowth, that in some, in 17% of the mining uh, conflicts that uh, have been reported, in, or were reported when we did the analysis, there is a claim for something different. No? And this something different may go in the line of, uh, let's leave the resources underground, let's uh, start an energy revolution, let's uh, develop, further the idea of commons, etc. So uh, with this, what I want to say is that in environmental justice struggles in what we call the global south, which does not mean exactly the countries in the south, um, uh, there are many different situations that we have to recognize if we really want to, to advance, to progress towards an alliance with, with the growth. 
And then some kind of uh, general ideas on one, how I think we can start is to recognize, and this has been said, many of the things here that have been said during these days, well, therefore, first of all, there are uh, common drivers of concern. It's clear that uh, we both, as movements, are against uh, the growth or the development imperative. There is this higher recognition of trade or unlimited trade as, uh, as, as something that uh, we want to um, act maybe against. Uh, and the idea that capital uh, accumulation in general, unbounded profits, is not uh, what we want. Then there is this idea of protecting the vulnerable alter views. And here we have the post extractivist, uh, post uh, development, no, post whatever, with high respect, initiatives that often are vulnerable because are, they, are my, they are a minority in, the, in a context that uh, goes in, in a different direction. All these local, regional uh, ideas, alternatives, or nautopias that uh, are there, and we can identify. <coughs> and relate to uh, the protection of marginalized groups and very importantly, feminist perspective. We have to take this in, in honest, and I see with pleasure that this is happening already and we started in the next room. And then there are some, uh, some common grounds for the alliances we can do, but always uh, rooted in a specific and specific uh, initiatives. And then there are some overlapping areas. I didn't really know where to put them. Important debates that need to be done together, like uh, the role of state is, is emerging once and again. Uh, the notions of well-being and the different, no? Different uh, when vivides, no? power and how democracy is, is uh, enacted. The discussion on limits, so everything, I prepared this before coming to the conference and every one of the, of the topics seems to be a part of a discussion that was taking place in a different room. And then these ideas, there are some areas that we really don't want to sacrifice. There are this, um, um, in, in the let's say French context, there used to be this uh, uh, zone développé, no? The, no, now it, there are zones that defend, no? so, so areas to be def defended. And this does not mean regions, specific locations. This means leaving uh, underground some resources we really don't want to use. So we can use this idea also as a common ground for discussions. Where to start? Well, wherever you want to start. It is not a a unique and only way to start a discussion like this. But the thing is, together, and when I mean this, the connection of different alternatives is what it gives the, the, the full picture. We cannot expect for one single way on how to start. We need to start. Thank you. Some of you, or some of the people in the pictures are in the room, and these are the students from the two, two uh, summer schools on the growth and environmental justice we had in Barcelona, and part of these um, insights come precisely from the discussion with them. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. So, before we open, I just give the floor again for one thought to Miriam, Edgardo, and Ashish. What are challenges, or what are potentials, what are needs to think um, and to, to push North-South alliances. Miriam, would you like to start? Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think one key challenge, well, it's, re it's about decolonizing minds, but also in this relationship. And it's about deconstructing the myth about the respective other. Like the South in the North, normally is represented as a place of poverty, as a place of natural disasters and war, which brings us to not see what Uli calls the imperial mode of living and the relationship that we might have to do something to do with that in everyday life, not only in the context of disaster and war. So, and the other way around, the North is represented in the South still as a place of fulfillment, as a place where success leads to happiness and blah, blah, blah. 
There are no burnouts, no stress, no precarity, no depression, no loneliness. And I think we have to make visible the bad living in the north to the south. And I think all of you are traveling to the south as a destination of tourism and that could be an entry point. Just tell the people how it really is. Since I was talking of extractivism, and there's so many issues that could be discussed in the relations between North and South, I'd like to co concentrate on the issue of extractivism and say the following. Extractivism is not an issue of the South. Extractivism is the destruction of the planet and struggle against extractivism can't be carried out only in the South. There's a huge difference between the northern left or the northern progressives or the northern activists and all sorts of movements to have solidarity, political solidarity with leftist governments, that's one thing, and something else is to be co-participants in the same struggle, not in terms of solidarity with others, but in terms of a co-responsibility of the process of destruction in which we are all involved. The impacts of extractivism are felt basically by indigenous people, by peasants, by inhabitants of the South, but it's a global process of accumulation. And most of the corporations that are involved in the process are either northern corporations or nowadays Indian or Chinese corporations. So the struggles have to be carried out simultaneously at all these levels. One of the things I think we've learned in the last few years in Latin America is that, as I said before, to confront extractivism from national governments when the current structure of the world system and the international division of labor and nature puts these countries in a situation of subordination in relation to global capital, means that even this sounds very orthodox and it's not very typical of the way I talk about things, we have to see the struggles as global. And not, I repeat, as a problem of solidarity, but as a problem of the defense of life, the defense of the planet, the defense of the possibilities of the growth, the possibilities of climate justice are a common struggle and the fact that most of the negative consequences can't be seen from the north doesn't mean that it's not necessarily part of the struggle. That's not just solidarity, but it's a struggle of our common defense of life. Uh, two challenges. One, you know, just like in the in the mainstream notions of development and good, what it means to have a good life and so on and so forth, uh, there has been a Western uh, domination, Western hegemony. We've always people in the global South have always looked up to the white man. You know, whatever the white man is doing is is right. Uh, so it could also happen with the alternatives world. And so even, I know, nobody in this room, for instance, wants to impose degrowth on the whole of the world. Uh, but because it's emerged from here, there will be a tendency amongst southern uh, civil society to say, ah, that's an interesting concept, let's have an Indian degrowth conference. Okay, now I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, except then what it does is it displaces a whole lot of other indigenous terms or concepts or worldviews which need to be promoted as much as uh, degrowth needs to be promoted. So I think that's one thing uh, in terms of alliances, a, a huge challenge for all of us. And the second one is worldviews 
are extremely different around the world and to the ability to understand world views. For instance, even just the notion of time, yeah, uh, the western notion of time is linear. A lot of other civilizations in the world have a circular notion of time. So somebody, when somebody asks me this question, oh you want to take us back in time, you know, when we talk about simplicity and environment and so on. And my response has always been there is no back and front and ahead, it's a circular time. So we're, you know, what is this thing about going back in time? Now that, that kind of those fundamental worldviews are different, none is better or worse than the other, but the ability to understand each other's worldviews means we need slow dialogue, no shortcuts here. And a slow dialogue as part of the alliance is also a huge challenge. So I would say these two challenges that we, have, we all have. Thank you. Thanks. So I, oh, I open up now. Who would like to take the floor? Please, you could address questions. You could make brief comments, please. And then we will have a final round. We, since we started 10 minutes later, we can also go 10 minutes further. Please, here in the middle. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. If you like, you can introduce yourself. My name is Charles Basi. I am from Nigeria, Africa, from the Global South. I work with the Central Bank of Nigeria and also work as an associate tutor with the University of Leicester in the UK. Um, uh, my contribution is that when you look at the Global North, you know, down south is being seen as a commodity you know, in terms of its systems, in terms of its values. And it's important for us to, in the discourse of degrowth, not to also export, let me use that word, or sell degrowth as a commodity, you know, to the South, but rather to recognize, you know, the fact that within the global South, there are, you know, systems, values, institutions that if we expand the scope of degrowth, you know, we can effectively accommodate this, you know, and also to recognize that if we have to wait for the global south to, you know, go through that linear process whereby um, we have to contend with issues that are being currently discussed, you know, or affecting uh, the global north, we probably would have missed opportunity of utilizing degrowth constructs principles, strategies, and mainstreaming those into the overall development um, agenda for the Global South. Thank you. Well, today is, is a rather historical day because uh, in Brazil the president has been impeached. And, and <clears throat> so I wanted to ask one question. If we talk at the level of concepts like degrowth, environmental justice, uh, and some other, many other concepts, then it seems, as she was saying, that why do you want to impose an agenda? So the degrowth conference, which is going to crowd out of, if we look at the level of practices, the first time that degrowth or the croissants was used, of course, goes back many years. But the first de croissants conference was in Paris in 2002, as many of us know, when Serge Latour said uh, against the notion of development and long life. Uh, uh, conviviality and decroissance in 2002. So five years before, five years before, in 1997, all watch and the people in Nigeria, Ira, and in Ecuador, they had already launched the slogan, leave oil in the soil, soil, leave oil in the soil, and a bit later, leave coal in the hole, and so, and leave gas on the, the, the grass or whatever it is. So this uh, leaf oil in the soil because of climate change and also, this is to me the growth in practice. So it's like saying we don't go, we don't want in Nigeria to go up to three million barrels per day. We 
are happy with half of this or zero barrels per day in Ogoni territory, and the same thing in Ecuador. And we would find many examples of this, including in India, with iron ore in Goa, or in Karnataka, etc. So this idea of leaving the commodities in the soil instead of selling them, of course, goes back to in Latin America to, to the 20s and the 30s and the 50s, isn't it? With the Cepal and Raul Previs. But this is, to me, the real confluence. And this is, is well, it's a materialistic point of view, because just to complete the question, it's not that the super cycle or God the Father or whoever is putting down the prices of commodities. The prices of commodities are going down because China, China cannot grow forever 10% per year, but also because there has been an overproduction, oversupply. So I don't know, the Vale Company in Brazil, when the price goes down, they produce more. And the same thing is happening in Latin America. And Macri now in Argentina has taken out export taxes to increase still. So this is not a lot of concepts which are needed. It's just that we were all mistaken, uh, for a while at least, uh, praising these left governments in Latin America. So the only thing that I think is new in all this discussion, to tell the truth, is that extractivism or the post-extractivism have won, intellectually at least, isn't it? Not uh, because uh, extractivism has been a, a disastrous strategy politically and environmentally and economically. And this is why President Rousseff is out. And the next one will be Korea, and not a single one is going to be left, isn't it? Because they have not. So we are responsible, people like Ulrich or myself, in Europe, praising these Latin American governments and not looking at the realities of the material flows and the prices, I think. Yeah. My name is Walter Batista. Um, I, um, I was very interest, uh, I found very interesting these uh, Venn diagrams where we, were, where we could see the different points of articulation and how they are matching uh, in, the, in, well, in the south and northern discourses. And uh, one thing that we were discussing a while ago we, as part of a Transformer project that we are precisely trying by allowing people to give uh, meanings to, to data and points in maps and telling them this is a degrowth project or this is a transition project or so on, that we also try to understand and find the articulations and dialogues that take, uh, take place. Um, on the other hand, one, one concern that I have um, as a, um, well, on one hand, as a, uh, with my post normal science background, I want to actually allow the, the let's say, the people to actually define where are their, their points of convergence then, rather than having someone external and expert doing this. So I would be interested in, in, in this aspect, how you actually dealt with this. And more specifically on this middle convergence point, I think it is very important as um, if we want to build alliances that are um, um, actually effective and, and uh, uh, they, they have to focus on, on not only on discourses or on topics or, but on very concrete projects where people come together and work and uh, coming together can today I think be both in person or uh, uh, virtually or both uh, and I would be interested also in this case in the if uh, with, uh, with this EG Atlas project uh, that you have, it's an am amazing, uh, it's always growing the number of conflicts that you have available. I would be also interested to what extent was this actually uh, feeding your understanding and to what ex extent is also the EG Atlas itself a project which is contributing to the building up of alliances between academics, activists, both in the global north and, and south. Thank you. I would like to invite also people to ask questions in Hungarian. We have translation and also people from the region to share their experiences in Hungarian or in English. How does this resonate? How um, does this really, um, yeah, in the sense resonate? Please. I am from Hungary and I should uh, uh, turn your attention for a mistake. 
you are speaking only about the industry, industrial products, trade and similar. But you have heard the most important, the most difficult question, that is the demographical question, the demographical problem. If in the demography uh, you cannot achieve in the democratic growth a degrowth, then you will lose this fight in all fields. That is the most important. If you, if in the demographical uh, field uh, remain this problem, oh, also in the future, then you will see more and more invasion, migration, uh, confrontation, and war. That is all I wanted to tell you. Uh, my name is Rajni. I've come from Bombay. Um, suppose we were to look at this global north and global south not as a geographical thing but as a class reality because that is also how the term has been used. I first learned it from Wolfgang Sachs some 25 years ago. And in so I would, my question to the panel is that if we think of the global south and the global north uh, as global north being all of us who are here and our uh, class members in whichever country we come from and the global south being all those who are paying the price of extractivism, uh, then my question is that how far out of our immediate comfort zone are we willing to look for alliances? Which means, are we, for example, willing to look at the internal pressures inside the global market system, in inside the capitalist system for change? After all, the f it is in India that we created the movement which forced the World Bank as far back as 1992, Ashish, Morse Committee report, and the World Bank began from then to look at the impacts of its own project. It commissioned its first ever independent review. As a consequence of many such activities, then you have the United Nations principles of responsible investing. The International Federation of Largest Mining Companies, some two years ago, has accepted the free prior and informed consent principle. Now, there are two possibilities. One, that that entire process is a complete sham and we should denounce it. Fair enough. Let's do the investigation and then we do that. Or the other option is that we consider that these are genuine pressures, just like people like us. We are people in the capital world who are trying for some kind of change and explore whether we want to see how those spaces can be expanded. Because my own research shows that those pressures have led to positive examples, have led to certain projects which have been carried out without exploitation, without at least the kind of complete decimation that you have described. And so can we look for those kinds of things outside our comfort zone? That's my question. Thank you. There is a, um, a last intervention. I ask you here on the podium to concentrate in your final remarks on two points. Afterwards, we will have time to debate and to discuss um, um, uh, outside, just to raise or to answer two points you, f you, you want to answer. And Mladen will have also some final announcement that we really finish uh, at quarter to nine. Please, Volker. Yeah. Volker Maufer, University of, Wien, University of Vienna. Uh, short question, easy one at the end. When you think of your own country, uh, how would you start to think about criteria for a benchmark for degrowth. So criteria for defining this person should think to degrow in his personal living style. Thank you. Does this work for you? That you just pick up two points and you answer? Who would like to start? Miriam. Um, about the demography question, I think we have pretty much evidence that demography depends very much on modes of living. So if we fight for more equality, that would be inbuilt 
that demography also evolves in a good way. And maybe we should focus more on gender violence and sexual abuse instead of focusing on demography concerns, because this is really a social issue that is pervasive in the global north and the global south, and that no state policy and no social policy really does address in the way that it merits. Um, and the comfort zone thing. I understand that you mean by comfort zone the social circles in, in which one moves. Okay, okay, okay. We don't really have very good experiences in South America, either with corporate social responsibility or with the practice of free prior informed consent that has been violated in a variety of ways, both by states and by corporations. So I'm interested in your practical experience, but I can't respond to it in this way. Since I'm coming from Venezuela and we're facing this tragic situation in which the government has decided to substitute this oil rentier state with an even more destructive mode of extractivism. Uh, we are in the process of talking to as many people as possible to give out as much information as possible so when we have some of the documents tri translated into English, we'll be using the reading lists of this conference and of the Institute of <clears throat> um, in Zagreb, et cetera, to distribute all this information. And I insist that it's not just a question of asking for solidarity, but to realize that this is sort of a new opening of a destructive process that's, among other things, contributing to the destruction of the Amazon, and we know the role of the Amazon in the global climate system. So it's not, it's not a local issue, it's a, an issue that has enormous global consequences. So you will get the information, and we hope that this global awareness uh, and the struggle against also the companies uh, which is important because we need to tell these companies that their investment is in a completely unconstitutional ground. It's going to confront struggles over and over, and even in business terms, it's going to be a very negative investment. Thanks. I just want to um, um, underline that um, an article um, written by Edgardo Lander is translated into English and it's probably, it's already, it's yes, the Transnational Institute uh, website, there is an analysis of recent developments in Venezuela and also this open mining initiative in the south of the Orinoco River. Just have a look, TNI Transnational Institute. Ashish. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, one, just a quick one on the benchmarking of degrowth in personal lifestyles. Uh, in India, some of us have suggested something called the sustainable consumption line and that nobody should be going above the sustainable consumption line. The attempt is not to say that the government should be imposing this, but that this actually becomes part of a discussion on what really is sustainable consumption. This is especially important for the 100 million or you know, 50 million Indians, including Rajni and I, who are currently probably well above the sustainable consumption line. You know? So uh, this is probably one way of doing it. It would include a whole lot of very complex uh, criteria that would have to be built into it but right there is as far as I know no no discussion on this anywhere in the world right now on what would be the thing and it would it would be a counterpart to what we call the below poverty line so nobody should be below a certain minimum of basic needs uh, similarly nobody should be above uh, what would be a sustainable consumption line so I don't know what that's one way of looking at it um, yeah Rajni I think this is uh, this is always a, you know, we have we constantly have this discussion in India of course uh, I think it's important to work on both fronts, to continue to expand the spaces within the system uh, and if one has to do that by either, you know, by, by policy advocacy and so on and so forth, uh, one does that. 
but also not lose sight of the fact that we fund, we need the fundamental structural changes in society uh, in in the long run and of course keeping very much also in mind that in that first struggle strange bedfellows can co-opt us uh, as is happening as you know with civil society all over india so whether it's the IUCN, which I'm sorry to say has become extremely complacent about a whole lot of things because they've entered into links with the International Council for Mines and Minerals or with Shell or with whatever. So that whole sex problem of co-option, I think, is a really crucial one to confront even as we talk about expanding spaces within the system or building alliances with uh, outside our comfort zone. Ja, tak. Um, well, um, let's see. Uh, with uh, with uh, my presentation, I, I precisely wanted to make the point that it was important to um, recognize the diversity and the existing experiences as starting points for a discussion on an alliances. That we should not impose um, our vision of what should be happening on even the elites in the in the let's say countries of what we call the south, uh, but we should not um, uh, think that the alliance is a natural one. Then we have to work for creating it. But my point was also that there are many benefits, both for what we want to defend say, as the growth, but also for environmental justice uh, uh, claims in the south of this alliance. This was my, my point. And, and then on the specific question on how the, uh, this experience of collaboration between activists and science is actually a transformative uh, project, I think it, it was a part of, of, of it, it still continues. And uh, I think there was already a presentation on this. Uh, there are specific outcomes of this uh, activity that take the form of uh, maps of specific types of struggles or maps on um, uh, complaints, claims, and a specific company. And in this respect, it can help to, yeah, to uh, uh, organize the thinking, the collective thinking. I would say that this would exist regardless of the existence of this exercise. I, I, don't, I, I think activists themselves can organize themselves uh, with, without this support. Um, this is basically all. Thank you. Before I hand over to Mladen, I would like to conclude this panel. I don't even try to summarize um, this panel and the thoughts. I hope that you got um, many insights, some insights, many insights, food for thought and motivation for further action, and that this panel showed you that, of course, it's absolutely necessary for a degrowth perspective to look and to consider what's happening elsewhere and to think what are the concrete forms of alliances, and I think we learned a lot uh, with respect to this. So please um, give our panelists a warm applause, and thank you for your presence.